Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are so excited to have with us Ronnie Landau. Ronnie is a Jungian psychoanalyst with a private practice here in Philadelphia. She uh, trained with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts, where she also uh, served on the executive committee. She's a senior training analyst and supervisor. She's the current president of the Council of North American Societies of Jungian Analysts. And she's a former president of the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts and a training director there. And she is the author of Dreaming for the World, a Jungian study of dreams during the COVID-19 pandemic that was published in the Journal of Analytical Psychology. We know Ronnie better as our, our teacher and colleague and friend and personally, uh, I have to say, I don't think I would have passed the Propodeuticum exams without Ronnie. So uh, much, much gratitude, Ronnie. And thank you so much for joining us to talk about uh, a very important subject that we've, it's been on our list for a long time to discuss mm -hmm. this. And I knew that you were the one that we needed to discuss it with. And that is this thorny mm -hmm. question of Jung and anti-Semitism. So it's kind of whispered through the halls that, oh, Jung, wasn't he an anti-Semite? And uh, there, there, is, there is some history to be reckoned with, I think. And so we thought we would pull it out and yeah. reckon with it. Well, thank you, Lisa and Joseph and Deb, for inviting me. Uh, thorny is the word, for mm -hmm. sure. I would also add... It's a very mercurial topic. Um, there's a lot of history here uh, that could take us, you know, many days, man, many months to try to sort through. Uh, before we actually maybe get more into the meat of it, it feels very important to me to recommend a seminal piece of work that uh, was written by another a uh, wonderful Paja and mentor of mine, uh, Steve Martin. He was actually the editor with Aria Maidenbaum. And the name of the book, which is sitting on my lap because it is so vital, I think, to this conversation, is called Lingering Shadows, Jungians, Freudians, and Anti-Semitism. Mm. And just to give you a little background on this, uh, this book... Uh, which encompasses uh, some really, I think, quite brilliant and varied articles on this subject matter by not all Jungian analysts, but primarily Jungian analysts, was the follow-up of a workshop that took place in France in, uh, I think it was 1989, at the IAAP, their 11th Congress. They had a workshop there on this very subject, Jung and anti-Semitism. It was out of this particular Congress and workshop that this book eventually emerged, is my understanding. And then they went on and held a wonderful conference in New York City by the C.G. Jung Foundation. And it was, my understanding was that it was... Uh, extremely well attended. Mm -hmm. And to your point, uh, Lisa, I just happened to uh, bravely mention to a couple of colleagues that you had invited me to come in and talk on this subject. And two responses that I immediately got from two of my colleagues, uh, one of them said to me, you know, I actually attended that conference oh. at the C.G. Jung Foundation. And 
that was the turning point that allowed me to actually go into training as a Jungian analyst. After listening to the variety of the Mm. struggling with and reckoning with this particular subject matter. And my other colleague said a kind of a similar thing that it was actually for him, his first foray, because he's a New Yorker. It was his first foray into Jung, if you can imagine that too, uh, of really trying to grapple with whether or not he too was going to train. And from a more personal notation, um, when I got interested in Jung and was considering training, I was hearing some murmurings, uh, particularly from some of my Freudian, at that time, Freudian colleagues. Uh, I was a therapist here in Philadelphia and, and some others who had great concern that what I was moving into was the psychoanalytic study with a very brilliant man, but who was himself anti-Semitic. So this has been a tension sort of very, from the very start. I, I was ignorant of that. I had not known that. Uh, so it was initially a little startling, but obviously it did not stop me from my initial, mm-hmm. initial deep motivations to really want to study Jung. Uh, a kind of supplementary interest that I've had that I think you, you all kind of know about has had has been a deep interest in the Holocaust. And I've done a lot of lecturing on that. And I had a, I was pretty much on fire about that, I guess you could say psychologically, really trying to reckon with it uh, and making use of our Jungian theory to kind of try to understand what happened. Um, So the subject of Jungian anti-Semitism has been Mm. sort of alive in the foreground, midground, and background since Mm -hmm. I've been I've been practicing for over 20 years. So uh, it still is a subject that is um, both profoundly important and profoundly difficult, I I would say, and certainly timely. Exactly. It's still alive in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in an effort to prepare a little bit so I could, could speak to some of the more um, historical aspects of this, of which I hope you can all kind of chime in with me, I, I opened up Lingering Shadows and Steve Martin, our colleague and also one of the forefathers who started Paja, uh, in his introduction, I just want to take a minute to read what he wrote about um, history and how we might Old history as we're thinking about this. So um, Steve says this, Dr. Martin says this, what we call history is really an active and ongoing process of distillation. Personalities accounted for personalities and social and political conditions that can never be completely accounted for or fixed. We who are in the helping professions and who deal with the histories of our patients know the truth of this observation. Mm. Just this idea of the relativization of history. We can get facts. We can collect, you know, information. We have reports. There's scholarly information about all of this. But I think we still need to hold this in a kind of, um, a gentle and not overly rational mm-hmm. way. And of course, as analysts, this is a tendency that, that we tend to do anyway, because this is part of the practice of what we do when we hear our patients' histories. So it is in the spirit of this that, that I'm hoping mm-hmm. that we can just talk about what's happened, kind of knowing that we don't really know. We, we know some things and many things we do not know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the un- the uncertainties of all of this. Well, let's uh, let's yeah. start, Ronnie. Just because some people may be thinking, well, what the heck are they even talking about? Where mm-hmm. so it's long been rumored that Jung was an anti semite, and w- where mm-hmm. where let's just talk about what the basis is for those accusations. Um, I mean, I I boned up a little bit uh, before this episode um, reading. 
uh, Jung's really terrific biography by Deirdre Bear. And by the way, as always, I'll be putting all the books that we're referring to in a book list that will be included in the show notes. And and so I think one of the main issues, and and maybe you guys can chime in with other things as well, but um, you know, Jung was involved in uh, this uh, a kind of eclectic analytical society that was based in, I believe, Berlin, and this would have been in the 1920s. And uh, Bear kind of refers to it as the International Society. I don't think that's its full name. That's what I'm going to call it. And uh, as the Nazis took power and they started to Nazify or organizations and remove Jews from positions of authority and that kind of thing, um, Jung had been the vice president. And um, instead of stepping back or stepping down, he agreed to serve as president. And this meant that he was... Uh, basically used by the Nazis as kind of a propaganda tool that they had this uh, eminent uh, psychiatrist from neutral Switzerland who was heading up this this society and and seeming to um, sort of validate what they were doing in terms of removing Jews. Uh, Jung was very clear. He spoke about it to many people and, and the the evidence is actually there that his motivation for staying in power uh, or, or assuming the presidency was to see if he could help the Jewish members. And he actually did quite a bit to do that. And I can go into chapter and verse. But at a, at a minimum, it was sort of a naive, <laughs> tone deaf thing to do uh, because he did help the Jewish members, uh, certainly. Um, and it is also true that the Nazis used him for propaganda. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, Ronnie, you sort of offered this word mercurial. It's it's hard to come down really clearly on one side or the other. Um, it seems to me that uh, this was an extraordinarily difficult moment in history. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, it's sometimes easier to say, well, he should have done this or he should have done that. But um, he, I think, was probably earnestly trying to uh, thread this needle the best way he could. Whether or not it was the right decision in the end is maybe open to mm -hmm. discussion. Yeah. What we would call today the optics uh, did not work in mm -hmm. his favor. <clears throat> So, you know, on that point, my understanding is that the Jewish members, it was as if they had a kind of ad hoc membership. They did not have a full membership. Uh, and those were the Jewish analysts that actually s did not leave uh, Germany. Many of them, many of them fled, many of them left. And so they my impression is, I believe that's what I read, is that they did not have a full membership, but at least they, they were included. Those that were left, those that had mm -hmm. not fled, uh, were included in this. Um, you know, as Jungians, we certainly like to talk about this thing called shadow, because this mm -hmm. is something that Jung really holds our feet to the fire about really uh, knowing about and knowing about these parts of ourselves that we rather uh, cast off, send into exile or don't know about, you know, send into the unconscious. We either never know about it or it gets repressed as we understand shadow through a Jungian lens. Andrew Samuel said something very interesting, though. Uh, he, he wondered about this, his acceptance of this, Jung's acceptance of this, and to what extent Part of his own Jung's shadow involved in this was his own desire to be the head, to be the leader, to be the spoke spokesperson, you know, for this group. Mm -hmm. And so his motivations, like our motivations for many things, mm -hmm. was probably multifaceted. Sure. So I thought it was interesting that Samuels brought that up. And what might we say about that? Well, it's a power shadow, right? That, you know, this was a very highly influential 
position that he was now asked to fill. Yeah, in so, Germany, which was in Germany. You know, the this sort of the center of scientific prestige at the time. And right. So I mean as a Philadelphian, you know, I think like being Swiss then you know, you sort of feel like, oh, we're Swiss, but there's Germany and, and being a Philadelphian, like that's how we feel about New York, right, Ronnie? We're like, <laughs> <laughs> can we have an inferiority complex, so. <laughs> I do think that point, though, that he, he had not only every intention, but did actually try to make sure that Jewish analysts were not excluded is a very important point uh, to what actually happened, rather than seeing him really in is trying to kind of cozy up to the Nazis and kind of be a a kind of um, spokesperson, yeah. right for the Nazis. Right. So can, I I want to just um, dip into that for a second with just a little more chapter and verse, if that's okay. And I'm I'm calling on. Uh, the work of Deirdre Bear here for a second. First, I, th 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 this has to do with this um, conference at um, Bad Neuheim. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but in any case. Um, mm -hmm. So there was this question about whether or not Jung was going to go or, or if he was um, you know, going to kind of boycott it. Um, it says Jung did go to Bad Neuheim, and his presence did provide a propaganda coup for Goering. More on that later. He knew it would, but he went because the Congress offered a possibility to protect the membership of German Jewish analysts. And then Bear goes into a very long and entertaining story about Jung's relationship with a lawyer named Rosenbaum, whom he had analyzed. And uh, he's, he goes to, to Rosenbaum and he's very, very insistent that he needs Rosenbaum to look over these um, documents that, that Jung had gotten hold of that were basically uh, documents that were going to require the expulsion of the Jews from the society. And uh, what he wanted Rosenbaum to do was to kind of tinker with it to, um, to kind of scuttle that intention and to kind of provide a loophole. And um, uh, Rosenbaum said, you know, what, this, you can't do this. You're not going to win. And Jung said, this is what I need to do. And Rosenbaum later said, now I was very young then, and the age difference between us was rather great. And the relationship of respect was, of course, that of the patient toward his analyst. But mm -hmm. all of that left me when I heard what he wanted to do. And so I answered him as his lawyer and, uh, you know, kind of said, you know, Harry Young, this isn't going to work. And um, Jung got very, very, and, and by the way, said, Jung, you're being naive. You, mm -hmm. you, you're, you know, you, you don't, you think you can hoodwink the Nazis? That's not going to work. But Jung was absolutely insistent. And so um, Rosenbaum did it and did create a way for the German Jewish analysts to retain their membership through this kind of loophole. And then Rosenbaum said um, he, he, he created clauses to fool the authors of these statutes in such a way that they would not notice it. And, and for years, those Rosenbaum statutes that were created uh, ki kind of helped pave the way for German, uh, for Jewish analysts to retain membership in the various societies as things progressed. So... You know, it's it. It wasn't a. Uh, it, it wasn't a kind of empty, helpful impulse that Jung had. He had a plan. It was a little crazy. It was maybe naive. It did actually work for whatever good it ended up doing. But he was he was committed to doing it. And there there's other clear evidence, for example, that he signed a lot of. They were called attests for. Uh, Jews who were emigrating, he would, you know, sign a piece of paper allowing them to come to Switzerland, promising to pay their expenses if they couldn't, uh, if they couldn't support themselves. He um, pulled a lot of strings to help people get resettled in the states or in in 
in uh, the UK. So it, 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 it wasn't, he may have had that power shadow too, and he was trying to do something behind the scenes. Again, mm -hmm. whether or not that was just a kind of futile thing, was it, was it worth giving that public relations coup to the Nazis? You know, that, that's a question to mm -hmm. be entertained. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking back uh, at this point to the context um, of Jung and Freud and, uh, you know, all of that earlier relation and that Jung was uh, the son of a Protestant pastor. And so what the, the bigger context in Jung's history with Freud, the psychoanalytic movement, and the context, the cultural context of Europe, especially sort of Christian Europe and, and Jung as a, as a Swiss and a mm -hmm. German Swiss, um, versus what the cultural context was, uh, was for Jews, that there's a wider framework here mm -hmm. within which mm -hmm. Jung's actions are set. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think that's such an important point, Deb. The um, really sorry. The complexity of the Freud Jung relationship that these two men had, mm. and the trauma that they both suffered at their severing of their relationship, the extent to, ne to which they never spoke again. So. After 1912, I think it is. Um, <clears throat> how close they became very quickly. Uh, and then, of course, we've, we're all familiar with the level of projections that mm -hmm. went on. Freud towards Jung as being his son and being like his father and his, the great mentor. And um, the new prince, the crown prince, the new prince that Jung was going to be for Freud to carry on his work. And certainly for Jung, kind of finding a father figure in Freud that he did not have with his own father. Yes. And so all of the complexities of their psychological relationship and the projections that went back and forth was coupled with all of the really brilliant um, interest and development of psychoanalysis. Uh, until the differences, until the great difference kind of and differences began to emerge, and many scholars have certain written have certainly written about the uh, the combination of both those very intense factors, the levels of projection, as well as Jung's mm -hmm. need to individuate his own psychology, his own theories from Freud's. The degree to which those two men severed their relationship and never spoke again, I think, says something to us about the intensity of those projections that that went on to each other such that they were never able to really commune again. I just want to also bring in the combination of the personal relationship between Freud and Jung and whatever contributions that has had to this notion of Jung being anti-Semitic. Yeah. From what I recently read, <clears throat> there are reports that shortly after their break, Freud actually made some rather accusatory remarks towards Jung of him being anti-Semitic. And part of what made that, again, very confusing is that some of Jung's writing at that time, when he talked about sort of the Jewish psychology and some of words that he used to describe it, certainly to most of us would sound anti-Semitic. So there's a kind of um, very... Uh, delicate, confusing, complex dynamic that went on there that is likely a combination of their own 
personal psychologies and whatever was getting projected with some of Jung's ideas Mm. about Jewish people, the Jewish psychology, of which he went on to write about uh, during, during world, well, prior to World War II and then during World War II. Um, And these have become very problematic writings Mm -hmm. for many of us who read these writings and hear in them what sounds like more of an anti-Semitic kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. That does not, in my my mind, mean that he was anti-Semitic but that he was writing things at a time, at a really vulnerable time, when these things could easily be be interpreted as such. Now, there are Jungian analysts that will highly disagree with what I'm saying. They will say, oh yes, this was an example of Jung's anti-Semiticism. So I think what we want to try to do here is hold the tension. And I think that's often very difficult to kind of... uh, Mm -hmm suspend the tendency to want to judge Mm -hmm. Um, while at the same time, I think, I think Ann Yulinoff writes about this in her essay. You know, we, we want to either defend him fiercely and say, no, he was not. Right. Or we want to cast allegations that in fact, of course he was. How do we work with, you know, these complicated uh, uncertainties, yeah. you know, that we do in our work. What uh, what I'm thinking about is Jung's interest in uh, the cultural and religious and mythological contexts of of nations and cultures. Yes, and that he felt that um, our cultural context influenced us, which of course it does. <laughs> And that that's a tough mix to say there is a difference culturally between this nation and that nation. Yes. This religious tradition and that religious tradition, they're not exactly the same. Uh, and yet then it predisposes people for, uh, to be accused of some kind of prejudice or uh, lack of understanding. Mm-hmm. And Jung was very interested in cultural differences and how they can influence us. He, he was intended to use language, I think, however, that, that became mm. a bit problematic around nationalism and nations and mm. races. I mean, he used this kind of verbiage that I, I think now, as we hear it, and of course, we are also aware he was a man of his time and the language that was used at that time is yes. not the language we would use now. Um, however, he did tend to have a, a, a tendency to look that way in terms of the psychology of nations and races. And that, mm-hmm. that has been a part of how uh, some of his writing and some of his, his theories have been um, elucidated. And I think that many of us would have a, have a revision, have some sort of revision of, of some of this now. And in, look, Whoever, whoever the theorist is, it's not as if any of us imagine that what we, what, what we want to do or need to do is swallow all of it whole or accept all of it. I mean, I think we are all continuing to edit, revise, revision. You know, there's the whole post-Jungian perspective mm-hmm. on things. So um, <clears throat> there's all of the capacity to, I think, learn from this rather than pass judgment on it um, and to be open to learn from Jung's what he was a bit blinded to. So I think one of the things that that as a Jew and what I've read that I think was a, uh, frankly, I'm going to say it it in this way, that I think was a blinding of Jung's was his fascination with Wotan or Wotan as the archetypal uh, underpinnings of what was happening in Germany and the rise mm. of that God. And he kind of glorified that. He saw it as messianic, I think, the great savior. 
uh, the great sort of shamanistic Votan that was going to come in and create a rebirth, a renewal in, in Germany. And he held on to that for, for quite a long time and was um, infatuated with, with that realm of that archetypal mm-hmm. energy. And I think was, was not conscious. Therefore, he was not as conscious as perhaps he could have been to the very destructive aspects of Hitler and Nazi Germany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's a much more articulate way to express this, but I, I think we, we know this. He was very, very captivated by this. Possessed, we might say, mm. kind of in our in our language. Yeah, it it was unfortunate timing. You know that he was uh, enraptured by these archetypal concepts uh, at the time that Nazism was rising. Uh, it created, as uh, you said earlier, kind of a perfect storm, mm. I, and then got conflated with uh, Jung as an anti semite. And I think there was also a lot of animosity between the Freudian circle and Jung. They, they actively attacked him and tried to destroy his reputation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very personal warfare um, from those that were adherents of Freud's. That Freud was the conquistador, as he called himself, mm-hmm. and uh, there was going to be the psychoanalytic movement, which was Freud and his followers. And uh, that in- included uh, personal attacks on Jung. You, you know, I, I just want to say, Ronnie, about um, his being infatuated with, with Wotan, and I, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I need to go back and sort of check the, the literature a little bit more closely. But in 1918, in his essay, The Role of the Unconscious, he was writing about Germany being a blonde beast prowling about mm-hmm. in its underground prison, ready mm-hmm. at any moment to burst out with devastating consequences. And he referred to the German character as barbaric. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, um, you know, he, it was even very prescient because he, he, uh, he, he noted that, um, the the someone with a Jewish background awakens in the Germanic psyche, not those wistful and whimsical residues from the time of David, but the barbarian of yesterday, a being for whom matters suddenly become serious in a most unpleasant way. So you know, I think I think he wrote some really some things that just kind of make me cringe about mm-hmm. uh, Jews, but he. You know, he did the same thing to, he subjected the Germanic psyche to the same kind of treatment, and it was not particularly uh, flattering. And and I mean, I think what we're all walking around is this kind of, um, I mean, I want to call it really almost kind of like pseudoscientific claims about yes. national mm-hmm. character, which mm-hmm. I, I think we, we all kind of know what he's referring to, like Deb said a minute ago, like, of course, our culture influences us, but man, you're on, sh- you're on really thin ice really fast. And it starts to sound reductive and bigoted. And, you know, it doesn't even matter who you're talking about. You know, it, it sort of sounds like, well, wait a minute, now you're really just trading in, you know, stupid stereotypes. But um, he was, he was pretty enamored of that way of, looking at it and it's related to his theory of the collective unconscious because he thought that there was a kind of mm-hmm. human universal aspect but he also thought that there were kind of, there was a kind of national consciousness as well and he always adhered to that and it it is the kind of thing that I know always makes me uncomfortable when I come across that in his writings well it seems to me that one of the ways that we can hold all of this is to understand Jung as a phenomenologist. That when he was at his best, he was able to observe or attempt to observe himself and others and the events around him as phenomena that rises out of a deeper and more mysterious wellspring. He 
over the evolution of his work, depersonalized psychic phenomena. He became less and less interested in blaming the individual ego for its actions or inactions or even its fantasies, but tried to trace a root to something more mysterious that is pressing upon the minds of individuals and the minds of groups. And he was attempting to describe that. I think it's impossible for him to have been totally objective in that realm, which I think he admitted in, in Cross's writings in all ways. But when he was writing about all of the archetypal phenomena and seeking to catalog it, not from the perspective of an expert that knows all of this, but from somebody who is discovering a way of orienting and using what was happening around him as a kind of laboratory to exercise this application of his new method. So for him to look at the patients yeah. that he had mm -hmm. and to ask about the phenomena that he was observing and the field from which that was rising, and then to apply that awkwardly or not yeah. to cultures, groups, subgroups, even his own analytic institute, and ask the same question. I don't believe that was meant to be offensive, although his struggle to find objective language is something I think that he tried throughout the course of his entire professional life. So when I look at his struggle to find language, to talk about Wotan, for instance, it's perfectly congruent with how he attempted to describe all manner of other things, assuming that psyche is actually real, <laughs> both individually and through the collective unconscious into larger and larger aggregates. And to try to use his intuition, his access to mythology, any other resources, to try to find some kind of pattern that could be named. And then as an intuitive, and he describes this in his early work on typology, to get a sense of where something has come from and where it might be going. And to speak in those very broad terms doesn't put him in a particularly prophetic standpoint. It doesn't put him as some kind of political expert who should be using perfect language in order to change the fates of nations. It puts him in this realm of being a psychological researcher who is trying to describe mm -hmm. something to himself and to the small group of people at that time who are around him. Mm -hmm. And from that standpoint, if we were to maintain that more phenomenological standpoint, it's difficult to blame Jung for describing the phenomena that he was able to perceive. And our reactions to his words based on what they mean to us now or what we infer for them is part of our own self-inquiry about what is happening in our own psyches. Mm. Someone uses a word and my psyche turns red or purple or glows mm. with warmth or becomes exhausted and sleepy. Is something to do with my soul and the meaning that I make of somebody else's language and their words. So I'm highly resistant to wanting to blame Jung or any other deceased philosopher for the words that they used, but I am interested in how my psyche reacts to the things that have been said. I think the concern, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ronnie. No, go ahead, go ahead. I think the concern that we may all be having is not so much about how Jung functioned as a human being or as a theorist or the head of a psychological association decades and decades ago. I think the concern, which perhaps isn't being languaged openly enough, is how the language and ideas of any published person can be re-weaponized to manipulate the political sphere and to justify things that are frightening. So the fact that 
Jung's language could be purposed in a way to seem to support an interest in anti-Semitism is particularly frightening in a current world where there is good evidence that anti-Semitism is on the rise. And so we become concerned about any of the material that could be weaponized to fuel a phenomena that is happening right in front of mm -hmm. us. That's what makes this material feel dangerous or perhaps mm. even relevant to, to a current topic. I think your idea of weaponizing is really important. And the, the sense of projection that goes on behind the motivation to weaponize, this idea of, I use the word blame. So I think as soon as we're starting to blame, mm. One way we think about that psychologically is we are now projecting some aspect likely of ourselves onto the other. And to what extent are we willing to reflect? I mean, this is what we try to do so much in our work, to try to understand what part of this is me, what part of this is you, where's the hook, you know, all of that. I do think we are living in a climate now where words are easily being weaponized. And I share a deep concern with you, Joseph, on this matter. And I have enormous respect for Jung because he was willing to be vulnerable, make himself vulnerable after the war. And he wrote, after the catastrophe. And he wrote Fight with the Shadow in 1946. And here he really, he becomes very open with us in letting us know kind of what he missed. That, you know, <laughs> that he, he openly says he didn't see some things. And he then yeah. talks about Hitler and the tremendous amount of, of evil, the psychopathic qualities of it. He also talks about and I think this is, for me, is so fascinating and such a really helpful part of our Jungian perspective, which is the way that he talks about the collective inferiority in, in Germany as a result of their losing World War I, the amount of starvation, the humiliation, just the, uh, the economic depletion that went on in this country. And on the positive end, I think he, in, he did view Wotan as some kind of initial helpful energies, a kind of compensation, if you will, to restore for a kind of rebirth mm -hmm. and whatever. And um, that, we could say, was a very hopeful kind of positive outlook. Um, but he was, uh, mm, how should we say, not as consciously aware of the darker parts of this. After the war, he absolutely was. And he, I, I find his writing, those two essays in particular, mm -hmm. really, really powerful essays. And he talks about sort of the tendency to kind of want to see the criminal out there, you know, and to what extent are we really willing to see the criminal in ourselves and how we are quickly able to split this off from ourselves. and willingly uh, wanting to project that such that we have the scapegoat, right? And this whole idea of the scapegoat phenomena, and that has certainly been something that Jewish people have, have carried, that idea of the scapegoat complex and so forth. And so for me, there's a lot of redeeming that Jung does in terms of being open mm -hmm. about his getting some stuff wrong. You know, uh, in terms of how he actually initially okay. thought of what was going on in Nazi Germany in the early uprising of yeah. Hitler. Um, and that what we really all, what we all so much need to do is be able to stay awake to our tendencies to weaponize, which I think is blaming, which I think is projection, and how that can become, let's see, it's a... Um, 
it's like a virus. It's a psychic virus or a psychic state of possession, Mm -hmm. right? And in the absence of a healthy enough psychic immune system, be it individual or in the collective, there's a whole state of possession that can take place. And to what extent we might be seeing some elements of this in our world today as well. Hello, listeners. I want to take just one minute to remind you about my upcoming women's fairy tale and yoga retreat. We have just a few tickets left. It is April 25th through April 28th in central Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful time of year to be there. It's a great group of women. We have a ton of fun. We hang out. We do yoga. We talk about fairy tales. We eat good food. Uh, We tell stories and share poems around the campfire. Uh, We do some dream incubation. It's a really great time. So if you're interested, pop on over to my website, lisamarciano.com, where you can read more about Women's Wellspring Retreat. Thanks. There's also an element of displacement, that old good Freudian defense that we're out in the world and we feel helpless there are frightening things that we can observe phenomenologically reading the newspaper watching the news maybe things we're hearing in our own families or seeing in our own neighborhoods and so we take that fear and that feeling of helplessness and we decide that we're going to attack something that we think we can get control over like demonizing somebody that's been dead since 1961 if I can really convince people that Jung was a anti-Semite son of a bitch, and I can really get all his books banned, God knows everywhere I can, well, then I'm going to really have accomplished something because I can't possibly go down the road and talk to or confront the people that are flying a Nazi flag one street over and have a bunch of you know, frightening things going on in that house. But you know what I can do is sit here and really try to take Young down or fill in the blank. So there's an mm-hmm. enormous amount of, I think, disingenuous displacement, which I see not just around Jung, but among any number of writings or public figures, which actually has no effective evidence, is no effective change on the issue. You could wipe all of Jung's writings off the face of the earth, and you wouldn't change anti Semitism one it in terms of what's happening right around the corner from your own home. Mm -hmm. But you would swear that you had done something really substantive by making sure that that's where you're going to put all your heat. And that's this false sense of displacement and even magical thinking. Mm -hmm. So it is good that we're talking about this because we're trying to create a certain amount of frame of understanding around Jung's writings. But I really want to confront the fantasy material that's being pushed into this mm-hmm. topic by certain writers and certain mm-hmm. lecturers. You know, Joseph, you reminded me of this whole cancel culture that mm-hmm. I think is so uh, active right now. And isn't that very much what you're talking about? That if we hear something that we disagree with, that we think is harmful, and in particular threatening, that uh, rather than being able to be in dialogue, which is, of course, what we hope to do as Jungians, that we want to split it off, we want to dissociate from it, we want to cancel it. And so, in a sense, that's what, that's what Hitler was doing. He was trying right. to <laughs> cancel out the Jews and the homosexuals and on and on and on. Anything that was perceived as threatening to the purity of the Aryan race. So this, this kind of collective, I don't know, what shall we call it, um, uh, regression, mm-hmm. because I think it very much is that, right? Uh, and has a kind of collective um, uh, infectious nature to it is, is very much kind of what we're living in right now. And, and, you know, the thing is that Jung really gives us the tools to understand a lot of this. So, I mean, I think that we've talked about this before on the podcast, but I think that the idea of shadow and projection of the shadow and the 
related ideas of scapegoating and that kind of thing are incredibly important for understanding prejudice of all kinds, including mm -hmm. anti-Semitism through the ages. And then, Ronnie, the other thing that you just mentioned in terms of how uh, contagious ideas can be. Mm -hmm. And Jung talked a lot about both of those things. And both of those concepts are incredibly important to understanding, for example, how the Holocaust happened uh -huh. or even what's happening in our world today, including yes. as regards, you know, anti-Semitism. So we we uh, we better not cancel him or erase all of his books because mm. we'll use these really we will lose these really powerful tools that can help us become more conscious. I'd like us also to just grab, put hands right on some of these ideas. So Jung had this idea that groups have a kind of collective psyche that can be described, and if we take that just at face value. That's exactly what sociologists have been doing since the birth of that science. And all of us that were trained as social workers, at least Deb and I, we are well, well steeped in this idea of group norms, group values, ethnic traditions, and the whole social work questioner to be um, particularly skilled at providing services within a group context. So for Jung to be interested in the psychology of groups or what is typical of cultural groups and what that might infer psychologically, there, there is nothing new about that. And by the way, all the algorithms on YouTube are doing the same things, grouping everybody based on their interests, based on where you live, based on how much money you make, and experimenting with all kinds of possible assumptions. So for those who somehow think that Jung was being anti-Semitic, I would say that his effort to describe the psychology of any cultural group was a reasonable effort for him to expand his own sense of psychological mm -hmm. interest in things. And by the way, that is still happening. The real issue isn't that he was, should not have been interested in the psychological, ethnic, or cultural qualities of um, the Jewish communities or Jewish philosophy, but once again, whether or not it was weaponized. Because it is intrinsic to the human consciousness to want to describe things. That was, that was Adam's first job in the Garden of Eden, was to give things names and to say that the kangaroo is different from a lion. So saying how things might be unique or different is different from setting up a hierarchy of values based on what is superior and inferior. And even if that information is then used at some time to distort and create a hierarchy, that's the misuse of things that are different from each other. Apples are different from oranges. And if we develop a national campaign to say that oranges are evil and apples are superior, could we then say, well, it was wrong to ever say that apples and oranges were different? Because <laughs> now it's being used to destroy the good names of oranges. Mm -hmm. But we are mistaking those things when we criticize Jung for his attempt to try to describe things, even if his language yeah. was imprecise or crude or, or frankly new. Because if you don't have language that you've been taught to describe something, then you make up language and you use metaphors to try to reach for something, which is exactly mm -hmm. what the alchemists did, by the way. Mm -hmm. You don't have a language for chemicals, you're going to just try to fabricate something. You don't have a, a pre-existing language to describe these these strange otherworldly insights that you're looking at as you stare at the central fire, you're going to use whatever language you have to try to point mm. to something that you think you're seeing. So mm. those are a couple of other things that I, I just feel so strongly about. You know, I'm uh, curious in the context of what we've just recently been talking about 
of how it happens, it, it's so difficult to tolerate the ambiguity mm-hmm. or what you called, Ronnie, the mercurial aspect of this. And uh, the, what is the impetus behind, uh, you know, wanting to, in a way, sort of demonize Jung for, you know, uh, purportedly uh, faulty perceptions about this, that, or the other? Of what is behind, what is behind that, as well as anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and all the rest of it, of how complex this is, mm-hmm. and how incredibly difficult it is to engage it. I wish I could be optimistic and say I think that we're doing better, but I don't think we are actually. <gasps> Uh, And I would have to say that my initial theoretical interest in Jung had so much to do with him providing a language and a perspective that allowed me to deal with the tensions of and of opposites, Mm. to reflect on these things, to not rush to some kind of rational conscious judgment, um, and to really work on these Mm. deeper layers in our psyche, both our personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. Um, What do I think? I think fear plays a huge role in this. Um, I think the degree to which individuals feel a loss of a sense of belonging, a loss of a sense of connection, Um, I was thinking about this the other day and just anticipating our conversation today, you know, um, not that we need to go here, but what is happening in the deconstruction of certain um, religious and spiritual um, containers that have created an environment where there is so much more fear and a sense of not belonging. I I hear a sense of not belonging coming from so many people that I see mm-hmm. in my consulting room and the way that families used to be operating and sort of the way that families stayed connected through generations. And there's been so much um, shift in the way and the way families no longer live in the same cities or the same countries. And I, I just think there's such a different in modernity. And of course, Jung was concerned about modernity, wasn't he? You know, that, that, have, that uh, it's creating conditions that is exacerbating, I, sent, I think, a sense of security and safety and feeling more threatened. And so then what do we do? You know, we try to organize ourselves around an idea that is um, a kind of artificial or false self or false collective self structure to to bind us to to give us that sense of some kind of security and often at the detriment of having to cast out mm-hmm. whatever it is we may decide is threatening us you know? whether it's the infiltration of of individuals coming from different countries migrating into this country i mean it's you know our difficulty in being able to tolerate difference i guess on some very yeah. fundamental level as well. I mean, it's obviously a comp- very complicated subject that uh, seems to be rearing its head uh, well, one pretty way, significantly, now, uh, significantly now. One way I would lean into that, which I think is very important, is that as a culture, we're back to Jung trying to describe the psyche, let's say, mm-hmm. of the United States, that we seem to have are observing this loss of interest in virtue and the primacy of interest in safety. Mm. And we can trace that to certain shifts in the culture, even some might even say to the birth of, of national marketing and Freud's nephew who began to, who invented yeah. This capacity to turn citizens of the United States into consumers, mm-hmm. and the fact that people now will vote primarily based on their economic interests, 
and not around principles, not around anything that remotely concerns virtue. So this loss of interest in virtue, just as you were saying, this primacy of safety and what safety might require, whether it's having Mm -hmm. 75 guns in your basement or whether it's driving strangers out of your city or your town, et cetera, et cetera. But Mm -hmm. safety pushes us into the instinctive mind and out of the human spirit. And we are seeing more and more people being tricked into thinking they are unsafe and then making highly instinctive and thoughtless choices. Mm -hmm. So my question is in many ways, what will it take to restore the idea of virtue, which, by the way, was Freud's lament at the end of his life? He was putting it in Freudian terms. Freud had lost everything towards the end of his life, barely escaped with his life. He was poor. His books were not being read. They were not being sold. And he had fallen into a terrible depression, thinking that what might have saved humanity could could possibly have worked. And in the face of World War II, he couldn't believe that, that psychoanalysis or the mere primacy of being aware of something could possibly change things. What he hoped is that virtue, which is the superego, an interest in virtue would be strong enough to stand against the id which wants to kill and destroy, wants to fight and and do anything it can to create safety in the survival of one's genetic material. And in the end, he believed that that had failed. Jung doesn't use this same language. He doesn't write about the restoration of virtue. He does write about the need for symbols of transformation. That particularly when he discovered alchemy, it opened up this possibility that there could be ancient symbols and the revival of ancient symbols that facilitate transformation, and particularly this reconnection with the center of personality, which, by the way, was still an uncertain venture. <laughs> that, that doesn't mean everything's going to be peaceful, by the way. So I think that there are, in my own fantasy at least, there are broad cultural reasons that, that things are more dangerous than they were at one time. We had interviewed uh, Yasha Monk a while back and had a similar conversation with him. His concern has to do with this collapse of liberalism, which he defines as a commitment to universal principles and that it is the commitment to universal principle by disparate people that creates a culture of unity around uh, an exaltation of concept, the exaltation of, of glorious ideas. And the collapse of that interest, which he, she attributes to this identity politics and the strange, desperate grasping for any sense of identity, which is, he feels, is being manipulated terribly by social media and other Mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Jung was trying to restore this understanding of the universal and that that did hold hope and that even as he was standing in the face of what was going to be a horrific disaster, global disaster of World War II, He was still looking for the universal. Thank you, Joseph. You know, it just dawned on me. I don't have the exact dream material in front of me, but towards the end of Jung's life, he had a really profound dream. And um, Joseph, you're nodding, so that means you probably really remember it more than I do, but But as I got reacquainted with it, what was very interesting was that he was being fed kosher food and he was being treated 
by, um, I guess you could call it a Jewish mother uh, to some extent. And he was having this whole experience of being nurtured by this other faith, by this other uh, spiritual connection. Um, at the very end of his life, when he was very sickly, um, I should have marked the page where the dream actually was, but I was reminded of that when I was doing some reading in preparation for this. So if we think about the way that we as Jungian analysts refer to our dreams and look to our dreams for the healing energy that is very much needed for the compensation of a one-sided conscious attitude that perhaps has not allowed for a deep enough integration of ourselves. And Mary Stein refers to the idea of integration as ownership, which I think is a really mm. wonderful way to think about integration, that which we can own about ourselves. And so I, in being reminded of this dream, I thought, what a powerful healing experience that Jung himself had with perhaps everything that he had experienced personally and whatever was kind of projected onto him, whatever was sort of part of his own shadow, that the unconscious produced this beautiful dream at the end of his life that was so profoundly healing for him. I don't know if, if I'm remembering the same thing, but Sanford Drobe, I think, references this in his book that yeah. Jung was being nursed after another terrible heart uh, cardiac episode. And as he was being nursed, he entered into a visionary state, and he experienced himself as an ancient rabbi right. being nursed by one of his, um, his, uh, his friends. And he had a vision of being in the Garden of Pomegranates witnessing the marriage of Tifereth and Malkuth. Yes. And, and why that is so important, uh, first of all, Jung was, was exposed to Kabbalah, mm -hmm. and particularly through the alchemists. And mm -hmm. Sanford Drobe uh, puts forward this thesis that if Jung had lived long enough, that was the next big piece of work mm, he was likely so to take on. That's so interesting, yeah, yeah. Because he was already dreaming his himself mm -hmm. into this philosophy of Hasidim and mm -hmm. that is the dream. Thank you. Kabbalah. Yeah. And he was eating kosher food. Yes. Yeah. I, yes. I didn't know. Yeah. No, I've got the I've got the reference right here. <laughs> you have here. the reference, Lisa, yeah, thank yeah. you. So he's in this kind of a hypnagogic state and he says, For a time it's this was the nurse. At this hour of the night, the nurse brought me some food she had warmed. For only then was I able to take any and I ate with appetite. For a time it seemed to me that she was an old Jewish woman much older than she actually was, and that she was preparing ritual kosher dishes for me. And, and then it goes on, Joseph, to what you were saying, that he's in the uh, Garden of Pomegranates witnessing the, the marriage of Tifereth mm -hmm. and Malkuth. And he is Rabbi Simon ben Yahai, whose mm -hmm. wedding in the afterlife was being celebrated. So, yeah. You know, I'm making a connection, see what you think of this, of Jung as a rabbi. Yeah. Uh, he has been a rabbi uh, in modern life with all his teachings. And I wonder if that sets him up especially as a bit of a target, um, just as anti-Semitism has been a target throughout much of history. That it is the learned tradition and the difference. What, what I'd like to lean into also with that final vision, which, not a final vision, by the way, but because he did recover for a while yeah. after that, mm -hmm. is that the marriage of Tifereth and Malkuth, if it's understood, is actually a description of the entire opus of Jung's professional life, which is also called Tikkun Olam, right. or the healing of the world. Of the world. Because in the in the um, religious and mythic story is that the earth has somehow lost its connection to a higher spiritual realm, which we could also call the loss of a consciousness of the archetypal 
purity of things, and that for Tifereth to marry Malkuth would be for the earth to be restored to a certain kind of spiritual clarity. And the redemption of the earth, in some ways, depending on the tradition, has to do with the recognition that all that happens in the physical earth has its impetus in a higher spiritual plane that descends from above. And the only way that we can look at the suffering and beauty of this world, the frightening things of this world, as well as the glorious things of this world, and believe that the world is still in right order, is to have some sense of the archetypal unfolding of all things, which would suggest that even the horrors in this world somehow are an expression of something greater than ourselves, which we may not understand for thousands of years. Hmm. So that is a rather lofty vision, but it's not a new vision, by the way, at all, in any particular way. But in his soul, not only was was Jung know, not an anti-Semite, in his soul I think he felt tremendous alignment and in fact had his own Jewish identity yeah. somewhere inside of himself that emerged at the right time. And it also gave him a sense of hope, unlike Freud, that at the end of his life there was a possibility that the world could be healed by something far greater than anything he mm-hmm. personally could do or the absence of anything that he might have done. Yeah, that's on a, that's on really a level beautiful. of yeah, that is beautiful, Joseph. On a level of how we hold dream interpretation, just to kind of really um, highlight what you're saying, so fascinating. I never really thought about it in the way that you're describing it in terms of his own um, claiming of these parts of himself that have this affinity or this aspect of <clears throat> Jewishness that every aspect of this dream is an aspect of him, yes. right? And so all of that was some aspect of him that mm-hmm. was coming into like a much deeper connection such that he could actually have the dream and feel that, you know, in the way that our dreams really serve as such a powerful tool to make those connections to these part of our parts of ourselves that have remained so unconscious. So it's a really, really important point. And Jung recognized thought about it that way. He did. And Jung recognized this in Neumann's work. Yes, he did. He was a dear friend of, and yes, he, he so was. loved Neumann and supported him and thought mm-hmm. that Neumann's great works, it, Jung wished he had written them. Yes, that's true. <laughs> One of the things that Neumann introduced to Jung was the idea of the ego self access. Right. And the ego self access is a contemporary psychological view of the marriage of Tifereth and Malkuth. Where Tifereth is viewed as the self and Malkuth is re- viewed as the ego. And the mythic union of those mm-hmm. things which has been rent apart and could be redeemed by right practices mm-hmm. and right understandings. Right attitude. And that's right out of the Kabbalah, mm-hmm. the idea of the ego self-access. Mm-hmm. And there at the end of his life, mm-hmm. he believes that he is seeing that, which as you said, Ronnie, mm-hmm. may have finally happened inside of him, that the self and his ego had finally mm-hmm. married in those last few months of his life. Yeah, and and, and Joseph, you're you know that's it's so beautiful to talk about the hope that he felt at the end. And one of my favorite passages is the is the very end of uh, MDR, where he says, you know, the basically the world is a horrible and a beautiful place, and and. I cherish the hope that there's meaning, and I rather think there is. He says it more beautifully than I just mm-hmm. did. 
but you're you're absolutely right. He had that 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 marriage of uh, Tifereth and Malkuth within. I think to have said that. There's such an appreciation uh, here for me of you know how hard Jung worked and what a, a depth of understanding he strove for. And that in many ways, he, he is a rabbi for his time and ours of attempting to unify psychology and the spiritual, uh, philosophical, archetypal dimensions uh, that have made him still such a present and important force in today's world. There's wisdom here. So I can't, I can feel us winding down, but I, I can't let us leave this topic before I bring in just one more thing, because I think it's just like one of the coolest things. And it's, we're, we're leaving this wonderful lofty place that you've taken us to, Joseph, and I'm going right back to the history, but indulge me. There is a great chapter in Deirdre Bear's biography called Agent 488, and I had oh, yeah. no idea about this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jung was employed by the Office of Strategic Services by Alan W. Dulles. And I believe the OSS was kind of the precursor to the CIA. Mm-hmm. And uh, his, you know, his contributions were considerable. He was known as Agent 488 in mm-hmm. Dulles's reports to the OSS. And those dispatches were taken very seriously. Uh, Dulles remarked that Jung understood the characteristics of the sinister leaders of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. His judgment on these leaders and their likely reactions to passing events was of real help to me in gauging the political situation. His deep antipathy to what Nazism and fascism stood for was clearly evidenced in these conversations. And finally, Dulles uh, once noted that nobody will probably ever know how much Professor Jung contributed to the Allied cause during the war. So I, I recommend reading Bear's biography. That chapter reads like a, like a spy novel, as a matter of fact. And it's fascinating. Yes. The, the people in Jung's circle, some members of the psychology club who, who were very involved as well. It's a, it, it's a uh, very uh, lively little part of the, uh, Mm-hmm. Jung's history, but but I think it does speak to uh, really where he came down in terms of uh, the terrible events uh, in the middle of the last century. So, and the last thing that I would just like to say, just in a very common sense way, is none of us know what we would do if an army took over your town mm-hmm. and had a gun pointed at your head. We all like to think that we would be totally rational. And we would make clear thinking decisions based on the futurity of the moment and how history will perceive Mm -hmm. our decisions. But you don't know. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, when I was a a failing actor, which meant that I was working as a bartender, (laughs) uh, in a a beautiful restaurant in uh, DuPont Circle in in Washington, D.C., and it was the middle of dinner, and the bar was. Uh, right there in the lobby. And right in the height of dinner, two men walked in with guns and they pointed them at me. And they said, empty the register. While that was happening, very tragically, one of the kitchen staff had just been out on the sidewalk and had walked in the front door. And one of the men just turned and shot him in the chest. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I have to tell you what, when you've got a gun pointed at you, I open the register and strangely, I have very little memory of it. I just started laying the money out across the bar about six feet. I just kept making little piles of it. I can't even tell you why. What was interesting is that that seemed to distract these guys as they were kind of scrambling to pick up the money. It threw them off a little bit. And then when people were walking from the restaurant back into the lobby, they fled out the front door. I have to tell you, in that moment, 
there is no thinking process. And I can't imagine living in that state that I was in for months or years, feeling that there is someone who is killing people right in front of you or right next to you, and they have a gun at you and your family. So to criticize Jung for not making an erudite, politically correct decision suggests such a profound naivete around what trauma is and what happens to the human psyche mm-hmm. in the midst of unbelievable, horrible circumstances. Right, right. So I also don't fault Jung for even making a mistake just to survive until he could get his footing and figure out something else to do. Well, and I mean, just so I, I did, I've known you a long time and I've never heard that story. So, mm-hmm. but, yeah. um, but, you know, unlike you, his life was, you know, perhaps not immediately threatened in most of the things that we've been thinking about. But I found myself having a similar thought during our discussion is, you know, these were evolving events and, and it was an incredibly tumultuous period of world history. And uh, what, what, what we all we all maybe think we know what we would do in the moment or the best thing to do in hindsight, but um, yeah, he was he was, you know, re- responding and reacting. And uh, what are any of us doing currently to respond mm-hmm. or to react to some of the evil that's around us currently? I mean, mm-hmm. I think we're all trying mm-hmm. to do our best, probably, but it's not always so clear. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a point well taken. Mm-hmm. A Dreamer is a 40-year-old male and an aspiring actor, and he titles the dream, The Little Burning Fire. And here's the dream. I listened to the recent episode on The Vital Spark, and I knew I just had to submit this dream. I had this dream about three or four years ago now. I'm an aspiring actor, but to make ends meet, One of the things I do is background acting or being an extra on TV shows and movies. So here's the dream. I'm working on a set on a production that's filming at a large mansion. Only this time, I'm not working in front of the camera. I'm working behind the camera on the crew as a production assistant. The scene is being shot inside right at the entrance of the mansion. I'm in a very happy, enthusiastic mood. I stand there watching the filming. Directly behind me are two French doors. Suddenly I need to use the restroom, but the restrooms are for the crew, our porta johns outside, and I can't get out the door because they're filming right in front of the entrance. Then I remember something. I know the owner of this mansion, and he's entrusted me with the skeleton key. And I think to myself, well, I've been given a key to go into any room in the house. Surely it's fine for me to use the one of the restrooms. I turn around and use the skeleton key for the first time. The key is gold and looks just like a big old-fashioned key. I open the French doors and close them behind me. Now I'm in a large study. It's beautiful and luxurious. It looks like old money, nothing too modern. There's a fireplace and comfy chairs, a large elegant sofa with lots of pillows, and of course a desk and many books. The room is lit only by sunlight. I slowly walk across the study towards the bathroom at the end of the room. I take my time taking it all in. I feel special being in here alone. When I get to the restroom, the door is locked. I use the skeleton key for a second time. Now I'm in a small restroom that looks remarkably like the restroom in my parents' bedroom. I stand to look at myself in the mirror, then I notice to the left of me there's a wooden medicine cabinet on the wall. I'm curious as to what's inside. I'm drawn to it. I try opening it, but it's locked. I wonder if the skeleton key even opens this small cabinet. I use the skeleton key for the third time, and sure enough, it worked. I'm shocked to discover that inside the cabinet there is only a small burning fire. It looks just like a small miniature campfire, and I'm stunned. 
Why is there fire in here? What's the meaning of it? How does this fire continue to burn even when the cabinet is locked up? Why does the fire not consume the entire wooden cabinet? I'm just awestruck. Then I realize, oh my gosh, I've left the key in the lock, and that lock must be burning hot from being so close to a fire for so long. I pulled the key out of the lock, and sure enough, the key is warped. It began to melt. Now I'm slightly panicked. I run the key under cold water, but it's no use. The key is obviously warped from the fire. Now the owner of the mansion is going to know that I've been snooping and that I found this little burning fire. I try to figure out what to do and finally decide. I better just come clean. He's going to know exactly what I did when he sees the key. For significant context, he offers, I've been on a journey of self-discovery for the past ten years. It's been a wild ride. Your podcast has helped me a lot. I just love you guys. Now you see and why the I main had to pick this dream. In the dream. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. He says the main feelings in the dream are happiness and enthusiasm, awe, wonder, and curiosity, and finally a bit of panic and dread. He provides a bit more and says, I remember thinking the study looked like a room you would see in the show Dynasty in the 1980s when I was a child. Mm -hmm. So what do we make of this? This, um, some dreams are really like fairy tales. And of course, there's, <laughs> there's a great relationship between the two. And this uh, reminds me of one of the Bluebeard fairy tales, of where uh, in the classic formulation of the Bluebeard tales, it's a maiden who goes into the, the mansion and marries a sort of wizard or sorcerer. And then he has to go on a business trip and he says, Here's, here are the keys to every room here. Um, help yourself, have a good time, except see this one little key? Don't use this one. And uh, so here is um, you know, some parallel here that he has, he has the key, a gold key. Mm -hmm. uh, to unlock mm -hmm. the secret. So that's the, uh, my, you know, sort of a broad brush frame uh, mm -hmm. within which I'm, I'm seeing this dream. Well, it also kind of has a, the fairy tale theme continues to, because uh, first of all, it's the key that betrays the maiden in the Bluebeard story it, because she drops exactly. the key into yes. the bloody basin and then can't wipe it off. And, it, and, and when Bluebeard comes home, he says, give me the key. And as soon as he sees the key, he knows exactly what has happened, just like in the stream. And also, there's a, there's a series of three in this dream. So he mm -hmm. uses the key three times. Yes. And the third time is the discovery of the little fire. Yeah. So it's it is it truly is just like a fairy tale of the stream and uh, yeah you know I immediately thought oh we've got to talk about this one. <laughs> well, it's interesting to me that he is trying to get into the rest room. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we think about a rest room, <laughs> we typically think about a bathroom, right? Think about a place where we can relieve ourselves of whatever it is we might be needing to relieve ourselves. But it's, he uses, the dreamer uses the word restroom. Yes? Right? Yes, he does. I believe so. Yeah. So a room to rest. Yeah, restroom, restroom. Also some, some place to go. He needs to go there. There's this beautiful, extravagant space, but he really needs to go to this restroom, which is a place that's typically more private, more personal, where he makes this extraordinary discovery once he finally gets in. And there's a lot of effort that goes on, almost magic. It almost feels a little magical, uh, you know, as you were referring to sort of the fairy tale, you know element of it. He has to do it three times, right? Three times. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then once he's in there, it is 
he makes this fascinating discovery of this this small f- burning fire. Yeah? Yeah. 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 But, okay. you know, first what happens is um, it looks remarkably like the restroom in my parents' bedroom. Yes. Mm-hmm. So f- he, he goes into the family or child uh, mm-hmm. complex. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm also so interested in um, our culture that somehow it's become uh, wrong to say the word bathroom. And um, he wants to relieve himself. He wants Mm -hmm. to expel probably urine, but we insist on calling it a restroom. Mm. He uses that word quite intentionally a lot. Mm. Um, And it's like the one in his parents' bedroom. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm noticing that there's this relationship with the owner. The owner is not present, but is implied. Mm-hmm. He's been given a key by this owner, and it's this kind of gold key, mm-hmm. and it has an mm-hmm. old world feel, and it's somewhat grand. Uh, but and and we we sort of deduce that the owner may be in a little bit of a kind of parental position because it's like the childhood, uh, it's like the childhood memory of his parents' bathroom. The owner has this mysterious fire that doesn't go out, that just uh, continues to burn in this way, in this um, secret medicine cabinet. So somehow that's where the medicine is, and is the fire then understood Mm -hmm. to be the medicine? And of course, I think this dreamer thought of submitting this dream because uh, in in the podcast we did on, on my new book, The Vital Spark, I think we were talking about um, both the Bluebeard variant, but also Jung's notion of this central fire mm-hmm. that uh, he used as a metaphor. He used that term as a metaphor to talk about, uh, you know, our, our, our kind of life urge or uh, mm-hmm. even, if you will, the self. And so I found myself wondering about this mysterious owner of the house who'd given him a key. And is that not an image uh, of the self? the owner of the house who keeps the fire. So when I think about the fire, I think about heat. Of course, we would naturally think of that. And this is a contained fire. And he's curious about how it hasn't sort of spread. So there's something very unique about this fire that it remains so contained. Mm-hmm. As you said, Lisa, in the medicine cabinet, where the medicine is. So I'm also thinking about sort of the alchemical aspect of this too, that there's some heat maybe that that is needed in his life. He's also, sounds like he's an actor who's kind of not getting his, uh, some frustration maybe about sort of who he is in the world or mm-hmm. what he's doing. And um, maybe there's some alchemical heat here that's sort of part of the medicine of, of what he's really needing for his own... Um, mm sense of aliveness or and maybe it's going back to some aspect in his youth when maybe there was more of a sense of that really needing to reconnect with that the early and you know we think of sometimes in our childhoods these are the times when we have perhaps a greater connection to our own creative life yep you know i wondered that same thing ronnie sort of beset by the sort of complexes and bruises of life and traumas of life. This, this, but there is something very numinous about it too, isn't there? Like it's just this very yes. mysterious, extraordinary thing that he's mystified by. But also wants to come clean. There's some, some way he, there's some sort of confessional right. aspect yeah. to this dream too. He doesn't want to be seen as as falsifying evidence or uh that's that's where i was going to is right at the very the very tail end of the dream um where the key is warped just like in the bluebeard tale of uh uh-oh you know now the owner's gonna know but he says now the owner of the mansion is going to know that i've been snooping and i found his little burning fire I try to figure out what to do and finally decide I'd better just come clean. 
he's going to know exactly what I did when he sees the key. So I think it's unusual that uh, the dream ego uh, is really willing to step up of uh, that the the you know oh no you know I'm guilty what should I do um you know I'm going to hide the evidence or or mm-hmm. uh it's a, but there's a relationship between these parts of the dream the the invisible mysterious owner the self perhaps and the dream ego of yes I looked yes I snooped and and uh, there's no Im- impetus to try to to cover it up. I, I think there's a connection there between these between uh, sort of this shadow element, mm-hmm. the owner and uh, the dream ego. And and in that way, it reminds me of another fairy tale, either the singing, <laughs> springing lark. Uh, which is is sort of like a Beauty and the Beast uh, variant, mm-hmm. or if if you know it better, Psyche and Eros. Mm-hmm. Because once he's opened the cabinet, that's it. There's no going back. The key yes. has now been permanently warped, and it cannot. It, the key cannot be used to lock things back up. So mm-hmm. in Psyche and Eros, she is uh, convinced by her sisters to light a lamp and peer mm-hmm. at her husband whom she's only ever been visited by in the pitch of night and when she does so uh, she sees that she's actually married to uh, Eros and uh, but then he flies away and leaves and it's this great tragedy but it's this very common thing that happens in fairy tales of it's a felix culpa it's a happy mistake because something that has been in the unconscious wants to become conscious Mm -hmm. So in that, I think that's a little bit like this fire, is it's been locked away. Mm -hmm. It can't be locked away anymore. Key doesn't work. Whatever that is, that repression, Mm -hmm. it's it's not going to work anymore. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. It's a Felix culpa. It's out now. It has been seen, it has been experienced, and... And its mystery has been experienced, and of course, it's you know it seems pretty um, uh, symbolic that it's in the medicine cabinet mm-hmm. uh, where where you find the thing that will be medicinal. Mm-hmm. And you're right. There's now there's no going back. Something is now known, and very much like the tale of Psyche and Eros, once. Uh, she sees who it is that she's been making love to. There's no going back. Once uh, the, the maiden in the Bluebeard Tales uses a little key and it is stained with blood, there's no going back. It's a new threshold. I'm still um, sitting with something that you had said, Ronnie, uh, um, about fire as medicine. Mm-hmm. I just keep circling around that, wondering how, what to make sense of with that. So you know, if, I, if we look at the arc of the dream, it, you know, he, it starts with this urgency that he's feeling and this place, the right place to somehow let go. Like you said, mm-hmm. Ronnie, perhaps it's a confession some other form of psychic tension that's really struggling. He can't find the right place to do this. And then that circuitous process leads him to find the fire in the medicine cabinet and and Mm -hmm. marvel at it. And then the fire has an effect. And the the fire has a melting effect Mm. on the key. And the key is going to force him to confess something, Mm -hmm. which is a a bit where you were going even in the beginning of the dream with the urgency to find the the confessional, i.e. the toilet. So fate is going to force him to have to confess something. Mm. But I am wondering about 
a medicinal fire. If we think about the calcinatio, which we were, mm-hmm. we were referencing, which is an essential process in alchemy, if we think of attaining the opus is, is the great medicine, and the idea of the philosopher's stone, which is the end product of alchemy, is said to have great medicinal properties. Mm-hmm. So this is a, a young man that is perhaps in an calcinatio, or there is a glimpse of something that is in store with him, for him. Mm-hmm. So a couple of thoughts that I have about the calcinatio is the calcinatio starts with the frustration mm-hmm. process. And he's already in that frustration, right? Mm-hmm. He's frustrated. He, does, he has to let go of something. He doesn't mm-hmm. know where to do it. And by the way, he still hasn't gone to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> he's gone to bathrooms, <laughs> but he hasn't finally sat down and like done his business. Mm-hmm. So there he is still with this, the mm-hmm. fire of frustration that is small, but it is, mm-hmm. it's building inside of him. If this happens, I think as one of you had said, this may have something to do with his career. He wants to be an actor, he's being an extra, and here he is now working on the production staff. Mm -hmm. So there may be a very important transformative frustration with the career that is going to require some transformative clarification about his image of himself in terms of his professional life or Mm -hmm. his identity, perhaps as a performing artist. I'm also really fascinated by the melted key mm-hmm. and uh, wondering what to make of that. If the key something's been, being transformed, yeah. yes, it's changed. Mm-hmm. It's no longer going to operate or the way it had been. Mm-hmm. Perhaps a new entrance or a new engagement, a new approach, a new attitude, Mm -hmm. perhaps, but the key key is no longer in service to him in the way that it has been. It feels like to find another way in. Mm -hmm. Exactly. A less sneaky way in, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, It feels like this story, in a way, is over. He's had. Uh, per every good fairy tale, three ch- times to use mm-hmm. the key. Mm-hmm. And this will not be the way forward. Uh, that part is over. And uh, he says, I better come clean with the owner of the mansion. It feels like that's the next step, is a different kind of encounter. Mm-hmm. And we don't know who the owner of the mansion is, female, male. We have no idea. So I have no idea. No, that's yeah. okay. But if if my little supposition that the owner, the mysterious owner, might be a kind of self-image, then we could say that the dreamer has an appropriate attitude toward the mm-hmm. unconscious, toward the self, and that there will be a kind of reckoning with the self because yes. the, the owner is only implied. We don't see him. But at the end, it's a sense, I better come clean. It's like, he's going to have a discussion. Mm-hmm. He's going to have a discussion with that owner. So there's going to be right. a, 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 some kind of closer relationship. Yeah. There won't be a mystery to one another anymore. Mm-hmm. So, so perhaps direct- it's like what you mentioned earlier, Joseph, the ego self-axis is being activated here. This is about the marriage of Tifroth and Malkuth. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. And for mm-hmm. this call for directness, direct engagement, and rather than sneaking mm-hmm. around and, and pro, you know, skulking through, what, mm-hmm. through life. Yeah, maybe feeling more entitled in a, in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. Actually ask Sense for Sense of what belonging in the space rather than yeah. just kind of a break-in, so to speak, although he doesn't describe it quite that way. But. Mm-hmm. I think of my own, again, my failed career as an actor in my late teens, early 20s. Mm-hmm. And there is just such an unbelievable amount of pandering that you're, you'll just, you'll take any job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
to, to get a call, to get an audition, to get a chance. The ridiculous kind of shows or commercials. I mean, I told you my turning point was in my young career, I'd been called to audition for a commercial and I arrive and we're all being asked to dance with a loaf of bread. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that sounds da, like a nightmare. Da, 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 oh, maybe it was Wonder Bread. <laughs> I mean, the, the, my face must have been bright red. Luckily, I'm watching all these uh, actors trying to improv with a life of bre- loaf of bread, making it into a baby. One woman <laughs> pretended it came out of her hips and dropped onto the floor. You know, I mean, it was like people were just doing anything they could to get attention. Mm. I, I was just at a loss, and and I thought. This, this is where my life has come to. <laughs> and then thought, let me let me go become a Jungian analyst. <laughs> it was a liberating fire of humiliation, actually. <laughs> so there is all of that. That's mm. that just pandering. Oh, mm. and I was an extra, of course, and a stand-in, and all of that. So I feel a lot of sympathy for this guy mm-hmm. finding that little fire and asking himself, God, is there something else <laughs> that, I, that I could get going here? You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.